Thursday, July the first, Dominion Day, Canada. Nigel has arranged for me to have a blind date with Sharon Bott. I am meeting her at the roller skating rink on Saturday. I am dead nervous. I don't know how to roller skate, let alone make love. Friday, July the second. Borrowed Nigel's disco skates and practiced skating on the pavement in our cul-de-sac. I was okay so long as I had a privet hedge to grab at, but I dreaded skating past the open-plan gardens where there is nothing to hold on to. I wanted to wear my skates in the house so that I would develop confidence, but my father moaned about the marks the wheels made on the cushion floor in the kitchen. Saturday, July the third, twelve fifteen p.m. Got up at six a.m. for more roller skating practice. Mr. O'Leary shouted abuse because of the early morning noise, so I went to the little kids' play park and practiced there. But I had to give up. There was so much broken glass and dog muck lying about that I feared for the ball bearings in the skates. I waited for the greengrocers to open, bought a pound of grapes, went home, had a bath, washed my hair, and cut my toenails, etc. Then I put my entire wardrobe of clothes onto the bed and tried to decide what to wear. It was a pitiful collection. By the time I had eliminated my school uniform, I was left with three pairs of flared jeans. Flares! Yuck! Yuck! Nobody wears flares except the worst kind of moron. Two shirts, both with long pointed collars. Long points. Yuck! Four of Grandma's hand knitted jumpers. Hand knitted. Ugh. The only possible clothes were my bottle green elephant cords and my khaki army sweater. But which shoes? I had left my trainers at school, and I can't wear my formal wedding shoes to a roller skating rink, can I? At ten thirty, I rang Nigel and asked him what youths wore at roller skating rinks. He said they wear red satin side vent running shorts, sleeveless satin vests. White knee socks, Sony Walkman earphones, and one gold earring. I thanked him, put the phone down, and went and had another look at my clothes. The nearest I could get were my black PE shorts, my white string vest, and my grey knee socks. I'm the only person in the world not to have a Sony Walkman, and I haven't had my ears pierced, so I couldn't manage those two items. But I hope that Sharon Bott won't mind too much. Do I go in my shorts, etc.? Or do I change when I get to the rink? And how will I know which girl is Sharon Bott? I've only seen her in school uniform, and in my experience, girls are unrecognisable when they're in civilian clothes. Must stop. It's time to go. Six p.m. That's the first and last time I go roller skating. Sharon Bott is an expert. She went whizzing off at forty miles per hour, only stopping now and again to do the splits in midair. Sometimes she slowed down to say, "Let go of the barrier, Dumbo," but she didn't stay long enough for me to divert her into having a longer conversation. When it was time for the under twelves to monopolise the rink, she sped to the barrier and helped me into the coffee bar. We had a coke, then I clumped off to the cloak room to get the grapes. When I gave her them, she said, "Why have you bought me grapes? I'm not poorly." I dropped a hint by looking knowingly at her figure in its lycra body stocking and mini skirt, but then the roller disco started and she sped off to do wild disco dancing on her skates. She was soon surrounded by tall skated youths in satin shorts, so I staggered off to get changed. I rang Nigel when I got home. I complained that Sharon Bott was a dead loss. He said that Sharon Bott had already rung him to complain that I had showed her up by dressing in my school PE kit. Nigel said that he is giving up matchmaking. Sunday, July the fourth, fourth after Trinity, American Independence Day. I was just starting to eat my Sunday dinner when Bert Baxter rang and asked me to go round urgently. I bolted my spaghetti bolognese down as quickly as I could and ran round to Bert's. Saber, the vicious Alsatian, was standing at the door looking worried. As a precaution, I gave him a dog chock and hurried into the bungalow. Bert was sitting in the living room in his wheelchair. The television was switched off, so I knew something serious had happened. He said, "Queenie's had a bad turn." I went into the tiny bedroom. Queenie was lying in the big, saggy bed, looking gruesome. 
she hadn't put her artificial cheeks or lips on. She said, You're a good lad to come round, Adrian. I asked her what was wrong. She said, I've been having pains like red-hot needles in my chest. Bert interrupted. You said the pains were like red-hot knives five minutes ago. Needles, knives, who cares, she said. I asked Bert if he had called the doctor. He said he hadn't because Queenie was frightened of doctors. I rang my mother and asked for her advice. She said she'd come round. While we waited for her, I made a cup of tea and fed Sabre and made Bert a beetroot sandwich. My mother and father came and took over. My mother phoned for an ambulance. It was a good job they did because while it was coming, Queenie went a bit strange and started talking about ration books and stuff. Bert held her hand and called her a daft old bat. The ambulance men were just shutting the doors when Queenie shouted out, Fetch me pot of rouge. I'm not going until I've got me rouge. I ran into the bedroom and looked on the dressing table. The top was covered in pots and hairnets and hairpins and china dishes and lace mats and photos of babies and weddings. I found the rouge in a little drawer and took it to Queenie. My mother went off in the ambulance and me and my father stayed behind to comfort Bert. Two hours later, my mother rang from the hospital to say that Queenie had had a stroke and would be in hospital for ages. Bert said, What am I going to do without my girl to help me? Girl, Queenie is 78. Bert wouldn't come home with us. He is scared that the council will take his bungalow away from him. Monday, July the 5th, Independence Day holiday, USA. Queenie can't speak. She is sort of awake, but she can't move her mouth muscles. My mother has been round at Bert's all day, cleaning and cooking. My father is going to call in every day on his way home from the canal. I have promised to take horrible sabre for his morning and evening walks. Tuesday, July the 6th. Full moon. Bert's social worker, Katie Bell, has been to see Bert. She wants Bert to go back into the Alderman Cooper Sunshine Home temporarily. Bert said he would prefer death to that morgue. Katie Bell is coming round to see us tomorrow. She is checking Bert's lie that my mother and father and me are providing 24-hour care for him. Queenie is still very poorly. Wednesday, July the 7th. Katie Bell is a strange woman. She talks and looks a bit like Rick Lemon. She was wearing a donkey jacket and denim jeans and she had long greasy hair parted down the middle. Her nose is long and pointed from poking into other people's business, my father said. She sat in our lounge rolling a cigarette in one hand and taking notes with the other. She said Bert was stubborn and suffering from slight senile dementia and that what he needed was to see a consultant psychogeriatrician. My mother got dead mad and shouted, what he needs is a day and a night nurse. Katie Bell went red and said, Day and night care is prohibitively expensive. My father asked how much it would cost to put an old person in an old people's home. Katie Bell said, It costs about £200 a week. My father shouted, Give me £200 a week and I'll move in and look after the old bugger. Katie Bell said, I can't relocate funds, Mr Mole. As she was going, she said, Look, I don't like the system any more than you do. I know it stinks, but what can I do? My mother said, You could wash your hair, dear. You'd feel much better without it straggling around your face. Thursday, July the 8th. I left a note on Pandora's peg today. It said, Pandora. Queenie Baxter is in hospital after a stroke. Bert is on his own in the bungalow. I am going round and doing what I can but it would be nice if you could visit him for a bit. He is dead sad. Have you got any photos of Blossom? Yours as ever, Adrian. Friday, July the 9th. A brilliant day today. School broke up for eight fabo weeks. Then something even better happened tonight. I was in the middle of ironing Bert's giant underpants when Pandora walked into the living room. She was carrying a jar of home-pickled beetroot. I was transfixed. She gets more beautiful every day. Bert cheered up no end. He sent me off to make some tea. 
I could hardly keep my hand still. I felt as if I'd had an electric shock. I looked yearningly at Pandora as I handed her her tea. And she looked yearningly back at me. We sat around looking at photos of Blossom, Pandora's ex-pony. Bert droned on about ponies and horses he had known when he was an ostler. At 9.30, I washed Bert, sat him on the commode and then put him to bed. We sat by the electric coal fire until he started snoring, then we fell into each other's arms with little sighs and moans. We stayed like that until Bert's clock struck 10pm. Sex didn't cross my mind once. I just felt dead calm and comfortable. On the way home, I asked Pandora when she realised that she still loved me. She said, When I saw you ironing those horrible underpants, only a superior type of youth could have done it. It has just been on the news that a man has been found in the Queen's bedroom. Radio 4 said that the man was an intruder and was previously unknown to the Queen. My father said, that's her story. Saturday, July the 10th. My father took Bert to visit Queenie, so I went to Sainsbury's on the bus. My mother gave me £30 and asked me to buy enough food for five days. I remembered our last domestic science lesson, in which Mrs Appleyard taught us how to make cheap meals with maximum nourishment, so I bought £2 lentils, £1 dried peas, £3 wholemeal flour, one packet yeast, one pound caster sugar, two pints plain yoghurt, twenty pounds King Edwards, two pounds brown rice, one pound dried apricots, one tub cream cheese, half a pound krona margarine, a large cabbage, two pounds breast of lamb, a huge swede, four pounds parsnips, two pound carrots, two pounds onions. How I dragged it all to the bus stop I'll never know. The bus conductor was no help. He didn't assist me to pick a single potato from off the floor of the bus. I'm going to write and complain to Sainsbury's about their lousy brown carrier bags. They ought to stand up to being dragged half a mile without splitting. My mother didn't thank me when I handed her £15 change. She whined on and on about forgetting the frozen black forest gatto and tin peas, etc., she went mad when she saw that I had not bought a white thick sliced loaf. I pointed out that she had all the ingredients with which to make her own bread. She said, correction, you have the ingredients. Spent all evening bashing dough about and chucking it into tins. I don't know what went wrong. I opened the oven door and checked it every five minutes, but it just wouldn't rise. Sunday, July the 11th, 5th after Trinity. Pandora says I should have kept the oven door shut. My father refused to eat his breast of lamb stew. He went to the pub and had a microwave mince and onion pie and crinkle cut chips. He is asking for a coronary. Monday, July the 12th, holiday Northern Ireland. Brainbox Henderson has started a youth club poetry magazine. I have submitted some of my juvenilia, plus a more recent mature poem called Ode to Engels, or Hymn to the Modern Poor. Engels, you catalogued the misfortunes of the poor in days of yore, little thinking that the poor would still be with us in nearly 1984. Yet stay! What is this I see in 1983? Tis a queue of hungry persons outside the job centre. Though rats and TB be but sad memories, the pushchairs of the modern poor contain pasty babies with hacking coughs. Young mothers draw on number six. Young fathers queue to pay fines. Old people watch life pass by the plate glass windows of council homes. O oh, Engels, that you were still amongst us, pen in hand, your indignation a quiver, your fine nose tuned to the bad smells of 1983. Pandora read it at Bert's. She says that it is a work of genius. I have sent a copy to Bert Baxter. He is always going on about Engels. Tuesday, July the 13th. Brainbox Henderson showed me Barry Kent's pathetic entry for the poetry competition. K 
Kent is convinced he is going to win the first prize of five pounds. It is called tulips. Nice, red, tall, stiff, in a vase, on a table, in a room, in our house. According to Henderson, Kent's poem shows Japanese cultural influences. How stupid can you get? The nearest Barry Kent has been to Japanese culture is sitting on the pillion of a stolen Honda. Wednesday, July the fourteenth, Moon's last quarter. Every night this week, I have been round to Bert's and taken vile sabre for one of his four-mile walks, but I couldn't face it tonight. I hate the way people cross the road to avoid us. Sabre hasn't bitten anybody for ages, but he always looks as if he's about to. Even other Alsatians flatten themselves against walls when they see Saber approaching. I wish that Queenie would hurry up and get better. She is proud to be seen out with Saber. She says, "An Alsatian a day keeps the muggers at bay." Thursday, July the fifteenth, St Swithin's Day. Pandora's parents took Bert to the hospital to visit Queenie this evening. So Pandora and I. Spent two brillo hours lying on her parents' bed watching the video of Rocky One. I kept my hands strictly away from Pandora's erotic zones. When the film finished, we talked about our futures. Pandora said that after university, she would like to dig waterholes in the third world countries. She demonstrated how an artesian well is sunk by using her lit cigarette. Unfortunately, the cigarette fell out of her hand and burnt a hole in the duvet. Andora is dead worried. Her parents are fanatical non-smokers. I am reading Lucky Jim by a bloke called Kingsley Amis. My father says that Kingsley Amis used to be the editor of the New Statesman. It's surprising how much my father knows about literary matters. He never reads books, but he is forced to listen to Radio Four on his car radio because the dial has jammed and he can't get Terry Wogan. Friday, July the sixteenth. Five thirty p.m. Stick insect has just rung to ask if my father is back from work yet. I told her that he calls in on Bert Baxter on his way home every night. She said, "Thank you. I'll ring back later," in a sad sort of voice. I expect she is regretting her promiscuous behaviour now that her baby is imminent. I told my mother it was a wrong number. Pregnant women should not be upset. Saturday, July the seventeenth. I have just seen my father and stick insect walking along the canal towpath arm in arm. I know the path is a bit cobbly, but surely stick insect could have walked without assistance. It's kind of my father to support stick insect in her hour of need, but he should be more careful of public opinion. If people see an old-looking man arm in arm with a pregnant woman, they are bound to assume that he is the father of the fetus. I hid behind the old bridge until they passed out of sight, then went to call for Pandora. Sunday, July the eighteenth, sixth after Trinity. My father announced at breakfast that he is going to have a vasectomy. I pushed my sausages away untouched. Monday, July the nineteenth, went to see Grandma after Bert's. She was making her Christmas cake. She let me drop the twenty pence pieces in the mixture and stir it around a bit while I made a wish. I was dead selfish, really. I could have wished for world peace or Queenie's quick recovery or for a safe confinement for my mother, but instead I wished that the spots on my shoulders would clear up before my summer holiday. I am dreading bearing my back to gawping holiday makers on Skegness Beach. The Queen's personal detective, Commander Trestrail. Has had to resign because the papers have found out that he is a homosexual. I think this is dead unfair. It's not against the law, and I bet the Queen doesn't mind. Barry Kent calls me a puffer because I like reading and hate sport, so I understand what it is like to be victimised. Tuesday, July the twentieth, new moon. Got a foreign letter. It is addressed to me, but it must be a mistake. I don't know any foreigners. Norsk, Riskringkasten, Bergen, Norway. Kjær Ära, Adrian Mole. John Tidyman, Vista Meg Dit Dikt, Norge. Ogjek Var Dipt, Rort, Avdefølse, 
de Utrecht. Jack Happer du en dag vil besoka vart land. Detter vakert, och du vil kunna opleve fjordin, og se hvor Ibsen, og Grieg levde. Som en intellectual person bird det interessera deg. Na du besoka os og snacka, med os vil du opdage, at vara vocala ica er sai ein domelige. Husk at ve beha langanetta og court dadger om winteren. I juni, er det helt motsat. Sarkom om sommeren, be skal ta imot deg pa beste mate. Till lyka med dine studia av norsk lar industry. Jertelig Hilsen. Din, Knut Johansen. Wednesday, July the 21st. Only eight days to go before my holiday in Skegness begins. I have asked my father if Pandora can come with us. I can't bear the thought of being alone with my parents for a fortnight. My father said, she's welcome to come along, providing she stumps up a hundred and twenty quid. Thursday, July the 22nd. When we were round at Bert's doing his cleaning, I asked Pandora if she would like to come to Skegness. She said, Darling, I would follow you into hell, but I draw the line at Skegness. Bert said, Pandora, you're naught but a stuck-up little madam. It'll do you good to mingle with a proletariat. Life ain't all dry ski slopes and viola lessons, you know. He gave a big sigh and said, Personally, I'd give me right ball for a week in Skeggy. Pandora blushed a lovely pink colour and said, I'm awfully sorry, Bert. One tends to forget that one's privileged. Bert lit a woodbine, sighed again and said, I shan't have another holiday now, not at my age. No, death's the only rest I've got to look forward to. To create a diversion, Pandora phoned the hospital and asked how Queenie was. The nurse said, Mrs Baxter asked for her pot of rouge today. Bert cheered up when he heard this news. He said, that means the old girl's on the mend. We put Bert to bed and I walked Pandora home. We had a dead good half French, half English kiss Then Pandora whispered, Adrian, take me to Skegness. It was the most romantic sentence I have ever heard. Friday, July the 23rd, 11 a.m. A dirty white cat turned up on our doorstep this morning. It had a tag round its neck which said, My name is Roy, but there was no address. It ignored me when I got the milk in, so I ignored it back. 6 p.m. My mother and father have had a big row about Roy. My father accused my mother of encouraging Roy to stay by giving him, the cat, a saucer of milk. My mother accused my father of being an animal hater. The dog looks a bit worried. I expect it feels insecure. Roy spent the day asleep on the tool shed roof, unaware of the trouble it was causing. Saturday, July the 24th. Went shopping for holiday clothes today. My mother came with me. I wanted to buy a grey zip-up cardigan from Marks and Spencer. There is a cold wind at Skegness. I tried it on, but my mother said it made me look like Frank Boff and refused to pay for it. We had a bit of an argument about my tasting clothes versus her tasting clothes. In fact, looking around I could see quite a few teenagers were having arguments with their parents. We walked around the rest of the shops without speaking for a bit, until my mother dragged me into a punk shop and tried to interest me in a lime green leopard skin print t-shirt. I refused to try the tasteless thing on, so she bought it for herself. A sadistic looking shop assistant said, That's a cool mother you've got. I pretended not to hear him. It wasn't difficult. Sid Vicious was singing a filthy version of My Way on the shop stereo system. It was so loud that the chain jackets and studded belts were reverberating. Our next stop was at Mother Care, where my mother went mad buying miniature clothes and stretch mark cream. I was hoping that she would buy a nice respectable maternity dress for the dreaded day when her lump starts to show, 
but she informed me that she was intending to carry on wearing her dungarees. I will be a laughing stock at school. Sunday, July the 25th, 7th after Trinity. Did a bit of O-level revising. I've got the lousy stinking mocks to do when I get back to school. I am doing English, Geography and History at O-level and Woodwork and Domestic Science and Biology at CSE. It's all a big waste of time though, because intellectuals like me don't need qualifications to get jobs or worldly success. It just comes automatically to us. It is because of our rarity value. The only problem is getting influential people to recognise that you are an intellectual. So far nobody has recognised it in me, yet I have been using long words like multi-structured in my daily intercourse for ages. Monday, July the 26th. Courtney Elliott brought bad news this morning. It was a letter from the Manpower Services Commission telling my father that his Canal Bank clearance project was seriously behind schedule. My father stormed on and on about what do they expect if they pay slave wages. My mother said, quite mildly for her, Well, you hardly work like a slave, George. You're always home by 4.30. My father went out and slammed the kitchen door. I ran after him and offered to help him on the canal bank, but he said, No, stay at home and help your mother with the holiday packing. My mother and Courtney Elliot were doing the Guardian crossword together and the holiday clothes were still in the Alibaba basket waiting to be washed, so I took the dog round to Bert's and watched the Falklands Memorial Service on television. St Paul's Cathedral was full of widows and bereaved people. I went home and chucked my Falklands campaign map in the bin. Tuesday, July the 27th, Moon's First Quarter. My mother had a pompous note from Pandora's father today. He is refusing to give Pandora £120 for Skegness. The mean git says that he has already forked out 400 quid for a canoeing holiday down the Y for his family in September, and Pandora's made-to-measure wetsuit was costing 40 quid, so he was unable to stretch his finances further. So... A fortnight without Pandora looms ahead, unless I can think of a way to make £120 in a hurry. Pandora hasn't got any money of her own. She spends all her pocket money on viola strings. Wednesday, July the 28th. My mother's lump started showing today, but she is doing nothing to disguise it. In fact, she seems quite proud of it. She is showing it to everybody who comes to the house. I have to go out of the room. Thursday, July the 29th. My father has been working flat out on the canal bank for the past three days. He hasn't been getting home until 10pm at night. He is getting dead neurotic about leaving it and going on holiday. Went to see Queenie in hospital. She is on a ward full of old ladies with sunken in white faces. It's a good job that Queenie was wearing her rouge. I wouldn't have recognised her without it. Queenie can't speak properly so it was dead embarrassing trying to work out what she was saying. I left after twenty minutes, worn out with smiling. I tried not to look at the old ladies as I walked back down the ward, but it didn't stop them shouting out to me and waving. One of them asked me to fetch a nice piece of cod for her husband's tea. The tired-looking nurse said that a lot of the old ladies were living in the past. I can't say I really blame them. Their present is dead horrible. Friday, July the 30th. Our family went to Pandora's house to discuss what was involved in looking after Bert while we're on holiday. Bert grumbled all the way through the meeting. He's never a bit grateful for anything you do for him. Sometimes I wish he would go and live in the Alderman Cooper Sunshine home. My mother gave this list to Pandora's mother. 1. He will only drink out of the George V Coronation Cup. 2. He takes three heaped spoons of sugar in tea. Three, don't let him watch Top of the Pops. It overexcites him. Four, district nurse comes on Tuesdays to check for pressure sores. Five, he'll only eat beetroot sandwiches, scrambled eggs, vesta curries and various dream toppings. Don't waste your energy in trying to extend his range. I've tried and failed. Six, he moves his bowels at 9.05am precisely. 
so please make sure you arrive at his bungalow in plenty of time to arrange the commode. 7. Sabre needs at least a four-mile walk every day. Any less and he becomes quite impossible. 8. Don't talk to Bert during crossroads. 9. Mrs Singh will cover for you in an emergency, but she must be chaperoned. 10. He's OK to be left at night, providing he's had his quota of brown ales, three bottles. 11. He'll accuse you of fiddling him out of his pension. Ignore him. 12. The best of British luck. Saturday, July the 31st. Rio Grande Boarding House, Skegness. Pandora came round early this morning to say goodbye. Normally, I would have been in anguish at the prospect of being without her for two weeks, but I was too busy packing my cases and looking for my swimming trunks to break down. Pandora helped me by packing my medical supplies for me. We finally left our cul-de-sac at 6pm. The car broke down at Grantham, so we didn't arrive at the Rio Grande until 12.30. The boarding house was locked and in complete darkness, we stood on the steps ringing the bell for ages. Eventually, a miserable-looking bloke unlocked the door. He said, Mole family, you're late. These doors are locked at 11pm and there's a 50p fine for latecomers. My mother said, And who might you be? The man said, I'm Bernard Pork, that's whom I am, proprietor of the Rio Grande. My mother said, Well... Thank you for your effusive welcome, Mr Pork. She signed the register while I went and helped my father get the cases off the roof rack. The tarpaulin had disappeared somewhere en route, so everything was wet through. I am writing this in my basement room. It overlooks the dustbins. I can hear Mr and Mrs Pork quarrelling in the kitchen next door. I wish I was back in the Midlands. <laughs>